David Attenborough is considered a national treasure here in the UK. He's most famous for his stunning and thought-provoking documentaries, but I'm sure you already know that because he's a very famous and popular guy. So popular, in fact, that proclaiming yourself to not be a fan might be as controversial as saying that cats aren't cute or that Sigmund Freud had a healthy relationship with his mum. So what, you might wonder, would make me want to criticise this wise old man who has spent a lifetime making stunning wildlife documentaries for us all to enjoy while educating us and bringing exotic worlds into our living rooms? Well, Attenborough does seem like a nice person who cares about the planet. I understand why so many people look up to him and are inspired by what he's achieved. And it's not like I disagree with him on everything, but there are recurring messages in his documentaries that really grind my gears, and these disagreements are what I'll focus on here. But first, let's talk about Saw. The Saw movies are some of the most famous movies ever made in the horror genre, but if you aren't familiar with them, here's a taste. Hello, Bobby. Before you is one of your trusted colleagues. She has been your publicist for years, knowing your lies, but choosing to speak no evil. She has been richly rewarded for her words, but today she will be rewarded for her silence. In the X-ray, you will see a key, the key to Nina's survival, which will shut off her device. But there's a catch. You have one minute to pull the fish hook from her stomach and unlock her device. Or else the four spikes will penetrate her throat, silencing Mina forever. So in Saw, there's this guy called John, who traps people in these trials where they are faced with terrible torture scenarios. In one of these traps, participants are forced to cut off parts of their own flesh, and whoever puts the most flesh on the weight survives. In another one, person A is forced to retrieve a key from inside the body of person B in order to survive. The reason they put this stuff in the films is because they know that most people are horrified by situations like this. And while many people, myself included, enjoy watching fictional horror stories from the comfort of our own homes, we know that it wouldn't be fun if it was really happening. Now Saw reminds me of nature, and I think there are a lot of parallels. And while nature is not set up by a psychopath like in the Saw films, the participants are trapped in a kind of dilemma, even if they themselves don't think of it in such terms. We have predators who, to survive, have to consume the flesh of other animals, and to do this they typically have to kill these other animals, often by eating them alive. Basically, some animals try to survive by hunting other animals, and other animals try to survive by not being eaten. And of course, many hunters are themselves at risk of being hunted by others. It's nobody's fault that nature works like this. It's not the fault of the predators, or the prey, or us. And we're used to this being how nature works. I mean, it's been that way for millions upon millions of years. And besides, there seems to be no easy way around this. I mean, if there were no predators, then animals would suffer and die in other ways, like hunger and disease. But let's be honest. If ecosystems didn't already work like this, and if we hadn't become accustomed to it, and if someone proposed that we design systems where animals have to live like this, then that would seem like the result of a twisted imagination. Like something a psychopath would come up with. Like something that belonged in a Saw movie. Anyway, back to David Attenborough. Let's take a look at the trailer for his new series, which is called A Perfect Planet. You are so beautiful. They say perfection doesn't exist. But that's not quite true. Can't you see? There is one planet where every element has fallen into place perfectly. Planet Earth. Perfect? Perfect? Your counter argument to the claim that perfection doesn't exist is to point to nature and show footage of animals eating each other alive? Now, Attenborough is being a bit vague when he says every element falls into place perfectly, perhaps deliberately so. But while he says this, he shows footage of animals, some of whom are eating each other. The feeling he tries to give viewers and what he tries to suggest is that nature is somehow perfect. And well, even if we give the benefit of the doubt and interpret that as poetic hyperbole, it's still quite bizarre. In the trailer, they show bears eating fish. And perhaps for the bears, the experience of eating fish is a good one. But imagine being in the position of the fish, who is suffering in several terrible ways at once. 
I mean, firstly, there's the stress and panic you go through. Secondly, you have the experience of desperately wanting oxygen, but not being able to breathe. And thirdly, and probably worst of all, you're being torn apart by teeth or claws. Often the bear will start by eating the middle of the fish, by taking big bites out from its side. Now in the case of some particularly unlucky fish, the bear doesn't start by taking fleshy bites, but instead rips off their skin, which for the bear is a particularly nutritious part of the fish. Now if you don't believe me that this happens, then go on Google Images and type in bear skinning salmon. Now think about that word, skinned. Skinning has been used as a torture technique against humans, as we can read about in history books, and as depicted in shows like Game of Thrones. You know, I think we can all agree that it's not a good way to go. And by the way, guys, most fish never get laid. We know that because when fish do have children, they tend to have lots of them. But for populations to remain stable, each fish can only have about two children on average. So most fish die young from things like starvation and disease and from being eaten. And this isn't just true of most fish. I mean, the vast majority of animals in nature are small in size and they die young. The suffering of fish isn't a fringe issue. For example, we don't quite know how many there are, but studies suggest that there are probably at least thousands of fish for every one human on Earth, and perhaps even as many as 300,000 per every human. We are talking about trillions, and perhaps even quadrillions of individuals. Now, a fish who is born might have some positive experiences in their future, such as eating or perhaps even mating, but their death, whether it's from hunger or disease or from being eaten, might often cause a lot of suffering. As I said, fish die very young, and I think being a fish can be quite a struggle. And if they could talk, I doubt they would describe their lives as perfect. The trailer shows a short clip where there are lots of crabs. Well, here's another clip with lots of baby crabs being eaten by an older crab. Actually, sometimes crabs eat their own children, which, well, I wouldn't call that perfect, but perhaps some people would? In his trailer about our so-called perfect planet, Attenborough also shows hyenas. Now, I've seen some brutal footage of hyenas, which reminds me of a quote from Attenborough himself. He once said, People who accuse us of putting in too much violence should see what we leave on the cutting room floor. And if you search for hyenas eaten alive here on YouTube, you'll see that he has a point. But what about the hyenas? What's it like to be them? Well, I'm not a hyena, but this clip from Minute Earth gives us an impression of some of the hardships they face. Unlike most mammals, male hyenas are subordinate to females, which is probably because, unlike most mammals, female hyenas are bigger and meaner than males, which is probably thanks to their need to stand up for their offspring in this kind of crazy feeding frenzy. Male hyenas like Scarface end up plagued with injuries from harassment and hazing, endure prematurely worn down teeth from eating too many bones, and on average only live half as long as females do. Another interesting fact about hyenas is how they give birth, and Minute Earth has a video about that as well. Female spotted hyenas seem to have penises. Females urinate through these seven inch long phalluses, and they're fully erectile. But since they don't deliver sperm, they aren't actually penises. They're elongated clitorises. That's right. A female hyena has seven inches. If you're starting to feel a little bit inadequate watching this video, you're not alone. Isn't Mother Nature f perfect? You think this is perfect, David? Take a look at this and tell me that it's perfect. Then there's giving birth which involves forcing a four pound cub through an inch wide, 23 inch long birth canal, which is not easy. For first time moms, somewhere around 60% of cubs get stuck in this gauntlet and suffocate before they're even born. And a dead cub stuck in a mom's pseudopenis can be fatal for her too. A mom's pseudopenis actually has to rip for her to give birth successfully, which leaves behind a stretchy patch that does make birth easier the next time. Beautiful. Let's take a look at some more of Attenborough's trailer. These forces allowed life on Earth to flourish. to discover how these diverse forces work together to keep our planet in perfect balance. Perfect balance? 
Let's explore that notion. We know that on longer timescales, nature is a place of continuous change. I mean, long before we arrived, nature changed from this, to this, to this. Some estimates suggest that 99% of all species that ever existed are now extinct. But also on shorter timescales, there can be quite a lot of drama. As an example, let's consider small mammals like voles and mice, lemmings and hares. The population numbers of these species can sometimes fluctuate wildly. In one year, the population might be at its highest, and then a few years later, it'll be at its lowest. And then the cycle will continue again and again, almost like a kind of pulse. On the tops of these fluctuations, populations can be hundreds of times what they were at the bottom, meaning a decline in more than 99% of the population, which makes the Black Death look pale in comparison. These small mammals who fluctuate so wildly in their population size, there are many predators who have them as their main diet. And when their main food source plummets to a fraction of what it was, well then the predators starve to death. Semi-regular patterns where the populations of predators and prey fluctuate is one of the more well-known concepts in ecology. And while this could be described as a balance, the balance has been constantly changing. And the balance of today is very different to the balance of a million years ago. So to refer to today's balance as perfect seems arbitrary. And even more importantly, behind these patterns are individuals who are being eaten and starved to death and die from disease. For every ecosystem, there are several possible balances. In some balances, there may be more animals who are killed by human hunters, while in other balances, there may be more animals who are killed by other wild animals. With some balances, there might be many large plant eaters, while with other balances, there might be many smaller animals who live shorter and perhaps worse lives on average. Often, the ideology is that whichever balance we had prior to human interference is best. But if we were concerned with the animals, we would instead be focused on questions such as which balance contains the least suffering, or which balance would I prefer if I myself were to be born into nature as a random animal? I think that when Atom reviews nature, there is something that somewhat clouds his judgement. Let's call it nature filia. Now, not everyone is as much as a nature file as Attenborough is, but I think most of us have nature filic tendencies to one degree or another. But what do I mean by nature filia? Well, it's what makes us look at a graph of fluctuating animal populations and think, wow, what a perfect balance. And not, what if it was me who was eaten alive or starving to death? It's what makes people think that bullfighting is hideous, while at the same time thinking that it's entertaining and beautiful when nature documentaries show scared animals who are unable to escape the fate of being eaten alive. It's what makes people see clips such as this one and think, wow, so beautiful, and not, Hmm, what's it like for the fish to die inside the stomach of a whale? It's what makes people feel like it's not important that the vast majority of the world's suffering is happening in nature, and instead be focused on things that feel more important to them, like, oh wow, this landscape really pleases my aesthetic sensibilities. It's what makes people think that even if baby animals who are being eaten alive are suffering similarly to what a human baby would, they wouldn't change ecosystems to make this happen any less, not even if they had a magic wand. Because it's beautiful, it's, it's the circle of life, it's the way things are supposed to be. Attenborough is aware of the suffering happening in nature. In one interview, he says, A lion ripping a gazelle fawn to pieces is not a pleasant sight, and the sound alone is awful. But I'm not haunted by it, no. I'm not haunted by anything much. However, in another interview, he admits that he sometimes cries over the fate of the animals in his programs. And while Attenborough's team doesn't usually intervene to help the animals they film, they did once save a group of penguins. When explaining to Vsauce why they don't intervene most of the time, he said the following. When it comes to interfering, <clears throat> where, where would you draw the line? What if I wanted to like help the chinstrap penguins get onto the land? Yeah. Is that a good way to interfere, or even then, should I let them grow at their own well, pace? Well, I mean, uh, if, you, if, if you see, if you're filming a little impala fawn, a little antelope fawn, hide, hiding in the grass, freezing still, refusing to move, and you see a cheetah stalking towards it, you know, and you've been filming this little fawn because you've been in its relationship with its mother, so you've only seen it suckling and so on. And the temptation, you can see this cheetah getting closer, to lean out of the land robe and say, shoo! You know, and, and the, now if you did that, certainly the fawn would run and would be actually 
terrified out of its wits and run probably so far it wouldn't be able to find its way back. The cheetah would have lost its prey, wouldn't have been able to catch up with it. Um, and so the cheetah would go back and, and have to f find another impala fawn. And the first impala fawn will probably not get back and be knocked off by something else because it's away from its home territory. So what you've done is actually make things worse. I don't necessarily disagree with Attenborough's reasoning in this specific example. It seems plausible that scaring away the fawn might result in more suffering overall. But that's not to say that there wouldn't be other ways we could reduce the suffering of this animal. What if we could provide some pain relief to the fawn as they're being eaten alive? If we can come up with an intervention that seems likely to reduce suffering rather than making things worse, would he be in favour of this? Or would he be indifferent because it doesn't add to the aesthetics of the scene? Obviously, I'm just using this as a counter to Attenborough's very specific example. And in reality, I think there are far more practical ways to reduce the suffering of wild animals. It's important to note that predation is just one form of suffering in nature. Other forms of suffering may be easier to tackle. For example, we were able to eradicate rabies from fox populations in Europe. Already there have been successes in using contraception in deer populations, and who knows what will be possible 200 years from now. I have other videos where I discuss if there is anything we can do to help wild animals, and I also have videos discussing ways we might make things worse. For now though, remember that if anyone asks you, is war unfortunate, you don't feel that in order to answer yes or no, you first have to determine whether it's realistic to achieve world peace. You see, whether something is a problem, and whether that problem is realistic to solve, those are two separate questions. If we someday create a utopia for humans, and if we stop all exploitation of farmed animals, then that would of course be fantastic. But would that make the world a good place to live? Not even close. Because the vast majority of the world's conscious beings are wild animals. And the great majority of wild animals are small animals, who live short lives and die from being eaten and from disease and from starvation. So it seems contradictory to wish for the world to be a good place to live and at the same time celebrate and romanticise the natural state of ecosystems. And while wishing for the world to be a good place to live doesn't guarantee that it ever will be, it's a good start. There are different kinds of concern. For example, you could make it your life's mission to ensure that the amount of blue shirts in the world and the amount of yellow shirts in the world are in exact proportion. But while it's possible to be concerned with almost anything, we should be careful to distinguish between concern for the well-being of others and concern more generally. So often, what's promoted is a concern for nature as a system, but not for the animals that live there. People like Attenborough will often speak of a concern for biodiversity and a concern for animals and nature as if it were the same thing. But it's not the same thing. It really, really isn't. For example, if an animal from an endangered species dies, then this will be viewed as a tragedy by most people. But if a million animals die in equally miserable circumstances, but these animals aren't an endangered species, then that will be viewed as the circle of life, and perhaps even romanticised. For the individual animal, if they're dying a terrible death, they don't care if they're the last of their species, or one out of a billion. It's really important that we make a distinction between concern for the species as a whole, and concern for the individual. Even though breeding more chickens on factory farms could be seen as propagating the species called chickens, we don't conclude that therefore it's in the interests of the actual chickens to be brought into existence. I think it's safe to say that most vegans agree that having more chickens isn't necessarily a good thing, even if it propagates their species. We need to consider what their lives are actually going to be like. The question of what life is like in nature compared to what it's like in factory farms, and the advantages and drawbacks of both, is something I'll discuss in a future episode. It seems that when it comes to farmed animals, we consider their well-being, and understand that since their lives seem bad, it's not a good thing to create more of them. But when it comes to wild animals, it seems we often fail to consider what their lives are actually like. When David Attenborough, in one of his documentaries, supports the active replanting of trees so that we can have forests in areas where there currently aren't, he doesn't seem to stop and ask if doing so would be a favour to the individual animals who would be born because of this. When interviewed by Vsauce, Attenborough was asked what advice he had for future science communicators, and one of the things he said was this. And in any case, the advice I give is bound to be about yesterday's technology or yesterday's way of doing things. And tomorrow is what we're on about, mm. and, and it's, the, it's young people today who are using the new technology in ways that I can't dream of. Now Attenborough was talking about science communication here, but perhaps there is also something to glean from this when it comes to moral conventions. From earlier generations, we inherit moral values. 
Some of these are good and worth keeping, while others might not be. And determining which is which can be a challenge. But my advice would be that even though Attenborough comes across as very wise, we should be open to the possibility that important perspectives are missing from his documentaries. You know, Attenborough has been cranking out documentaries for as long as I can remember. In fact, part of me wonders if he'll just keep doing that forever. But if he doesn't, then how do I hope he'll be remembered? Well, if it was up to me, he would be remembered in a nuanced way. As someone who was sometimes right and sometimes wrong. As a man who on a personal level was nice and funny. As someone who made visually stunning documentaries. And as someone whose messages did contain wisdom, but that also weren't perfect. Definitely not perfect. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of my future content. Of course, a huge thank you to my patrons who are enabling me to put so much time and effort into my videos, but also enabling me to work on bigger projects outside of YouTube. Thanks so much. And, and if you're someone who does find my content valuable, then please do consider heading over to Patreon and supporting me. It really does make a difference. With that said, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again with another video.